has come to be. Pastoral team that's here. And uh, not expecting God to do great things today, aren't we? Amen. Where two or three have gathered together in my name, he said he'd be here in the middle of the church. And so I, uh, I want to turn your attention right to the word of the Lord today, to Matthew chapter 28. Matthew 28, and we'll read the first 10 verses out of this text today. If you wouldn't mind standing with me. The reading of the word, and then you can just be seated. Matthew 28, and, uh, if we could read it out loud together, that would just make me feel a whole lot more comfortable. Is that all right? Amen. All right. In the end of the Sabbath, as it began to dawn toward the first day of the week, came Mary Magdalene, the other Mary, to see the sepulchre. Behold, there was a great earthquake, for the angel of the Lord descended from heaven. And Cain rolled back the stone from the door and sat upon it. His countenance was like lightning, his rain white as snow. And for fear of him, the keepers did shake and became as dead men. The angel answered and said unto the women, Fear not ye, for I know that ye seek Jesus which was crucified. He is not here, for he is risen, as he said. Come see the place where the Lord lay, and go quickly, and tell his disciples that he is risen from the dead. Behold, he goeth before you into Galilee, there shall ye see him, lo, I have told you. And they departed quickly from the sepulchre with fear and great joy, did run to bring his disciples word. And as they went to tell his disciples, behold, Jesus met them, saying, All hail. And they came and held him by the feet and worshipped him. Then said Jesus unto them, Be not afraid, go tell my brethren that they go into Galilee, and there shall they see me. I want to draw your attention to verse number 7 and to verse number 10. Uh, a very similar uh, phraseology is given to us in this text. The angel said, amen, that Jesus was going into Galilee and said, In Galilee, there shall ye see him. And then Jesus himself in verse number 10 reiterates what the angel had said and says, Galilee, there shall you see me. I, I understand today that the context of this scripture text is a physical location called Galilee. But I don't believe that, that it's just relegated to the physical location of Galilee. But I believe that when the scripture gives us two similar messages in such close proximity to one another, we would do well to identify the purpose of of the meaning of what this message really would be. Right. That in Galilee, there shall they see me. Amen. Jesus, yes, in fact, was going to Galilee, but I believe uh, that there is a message beyond just the physical location. And so if you'll help me today, I'm going to try to explain that to you, and hopefully we'll be better at the end of the service today. Is that all right? Amen. 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 I want to talk to us about Jesus of Galilee. Jesus of Galilee. If you put your Bible down and just raise your hands with me and ask God to speak to us through this uh, teaching today. Jesus, we love you. God, we thank you for your goodness to us, for your presence, your power, for your anointing that's in this room today. I pray, God, you help us. God, that you'd be with us today and speak to us through your words. In Jesus' name, amen. If you can be seated. So this afternoon, the, the radical truth of Christianity, which sets it apart from all other world faiths, is that God became a man. In fact, John says it like this, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. He was not just any man, but he was Jesus 
of Nazareth. Nazareth was culturally situated and socially conditioned by time and place. Jesus of Nazareth. Let, let's just get this out of the way quick this afternoon. There is no other Christ but Jesus. All right. Come on, help me now. There is no other Christ but Jesus. Amen. 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 There is no other Jesus than the Jewish carpenter from Nazareth who came out of Galilee. Right. He was not just a human being. He was a Jew. He was not just a Jew. He was a Galilean Jew. And throughout his life, Jesus and his disciples were ever identified as Galileans. And so it got me to thinking and pondering what would be the significance of Galilee. Why Galilee? In designing the master plan of salvation for humanity, God could have chosen in his infinite wisdom to have situated Jesus in any era, any social setting, and in any uh, social position that he desired. But for some reason, God chose Galilee. All right. We understand that Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, but his stay in Bethlehem was only a matter of weeks. Nazareth, which is a city in the region of Galilee, was his real home. You never read that Jesus was ever known as Jesus of Bethlehem or Jesus of Jerusalem. But rather, we read and we hear it's Jesus of Nazareth. Why Nazareth? Why Galilee? Why not Jerusalem? Why not Judea? Honestly, in order for us to understand the mission of Christ, we first have to go back and understand what he's talking about when he comes from a place called Nazareth, which is a region of Galilee. What is so significant about this place? And so I did some study that I want to relate to you today. Hopefully uh, you, you'll enjoy it and, and at the end you'll see why we got, uh, came to the decision that we have come to today with regards to Jesus. A brief geography lesson reveals that this district uh, of Galilee, it was a little island in the midst of unfriendly seas. On every side were Gentile nations that separated it from Judea. Isaiah gives us a brief insight in chapter 9 and verse number 1 when he calls it Galilee of the nations. Hmm. For the Jews living in Galilee, their home was not only surrounded but it was inhabited by different people of different ethnicities. There were Phoenicians and Syrians, uh, Arabs and Greeks and Romans and others. It was a multicultural, multiracial region, Galilee was. It was biologically and culturally mixed. Thus, the name Galilee of the nations reflected a reputation for racial variety and mixture. It was indeed an all-nations community. And the Galileans were, in every sense of the word, racially and culturally mixed. But it was because of this uh, uh, mixture of race and culture that history tells us and in the Galilee, it was uh, this mixture of race and culture. It affected their language. They spoke differently. It's told to us that the Galilean accent was heavy with a strong foreign influence. Galileans were often ridiculed for not speaking correct Aramaic and Hebrew. Their slipshod speech betrayed them. Peter, by the fireside that night, might could have denied Jesus, but he could not deny being a Galilean. Why? Well, Mark tells us his speech betrayed him. The people of Galilee had a distinct accent and it affected their language. They were a multilingual, multicultural people with all the implications and effects that the impact of more than one culture has to bear upon a people, their culture and their language. Galilee was a rich farming region. The term peasant and the common people, the people of the land were all terms that applied to Galileans. All of these terms uh, carry a stigma of the religiously uneducated people. In fact, the sentiments of the Orthodox Jews were summed up in their assertion that no man could marry the daughters of Galilee. And, 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 and I, I'm, I'm trying to be delicate here today, but Deuteronomy is very, uh, very uh, for, forceful with, with how that they describe the daughters of Galilee. 
Tell her she reminds you of a reptile. <laughs> salvation in the eyes 
of the pure Jews. For they believed that if one came up short in merits in the judgment, that the merits of Abraham could be added to one account, or one's account, so as to assure one's salvation. However, only those who could trace their lineage to Abraham would have access to his merit. This purity was a matter of salvation to them. And so by virtue of this, Galileans, by their cultural mixture, by the slipshod speech, by their racial divides, by the influence of all the different cultures around them, they were not only deprived of earthly social positions, but in the eyes of the pure Jews, they were deprived of their heavenly inheritance as well. Orthodox Jews believed that Galileans had no chance of being saved. They were predestined to hell. This is another reason why the Galileans were hated. This hatred was directed at both John and Jesus and they both took issue with this preoccupation with ancestral and racial purity. Both John and Jesus took issue with it. In Matthew chapter 3 and verse 8 and verse 9, bring forth therefore fruits meet for repentance and think not to say within yourself, we have Abraham to our father. For I say unto you that God is able of these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. Don't talk to me about your lineage. Don't talk to me about your ancestral right. purity. Yeah. You still got to repent. All right. You still you still got to turn away from your sin. Amen. Jesus declared to the religious leaders in John 8 that it is the belief in the Son of God, not being the descendant of Abraham, that would set them free. It is the belief in Ooh. Jesus Christ uh, that he is the Son of God, not the fact that you can trace your heritage back 27 generations uh, to Abraham. No, that's not what's important. Uh, Jesus said, it's the belief uh, that I am he. Unless you believe that I am he, you shall die in your sins. All right. Preach. One man said it like this, that God had chosen to become a Galilean underscores the great paradox of the incarnation in which God becomes the despised and lowly of the world. Identifies with them and becomes one with them in becoming a Galilean. Jesus of Galilee. God becomes the fool of the world for the sake of the world's salvation. Yes, hallelujah. You read in Mark chapter 1, Galilee is not only the place from which Jesus comes to be baptized, but it's also the place that he goes to begin his ministry. And this is where I'm going to preach to you today, because this is a heartbeat. One of the problems of our society today is that for the most part, people that have experienced a great deal of oppression in society, once they leave the confines of that oppression, they usually don't want to go back. They usually don't want to go back to the places that they came to, came from. Once they overcome the oppression, nobody wants to go back and tell somebody else that there is a better way. If there's a push for upward mobility that is so strong in our culture today that people no longer want to be identified with their roots. Amen. As one man said it, when the axe entered the forest, one of the trees was 
It was literally the last place anyone would expect the Messiah to come from. John 1, can any good thing come out of Nazareth? Surely if the Messiah were to come from any place, it would be from Judea, from Bethlehem, from Jerusalem, surely not from Galilee. We live in a society today that gives value to people on the basis of their place of origin. Mm -hmm. Where you come from matters to our culture. Yes. But by coming out of Galilee, Jesus abolished all stereotypes. All right. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right. Jesus was never apologetic about being a Galilean. Right. In fact, his genealogy in Matthew 1 reveals the people with whom he identified. Murderers, mm. thieves, mm. adulterers, liars, right. foreigners, mm. and the list goes on and on. They are all a part of his family heritage. Right. Yeah, right. It was almost as if he was sending us a message. Yeah. These are the people I'm coming to identify with. Yeah. These are the ones why? Because Matthew 1 and 21 gives us his purpose. He shall save his people from, from sins. their sin. Yeah. Now you can kind of understand why John said in chapter 1 and verse number 11 that Jesus came to his own. But his own received him not. They couldn't fathom, Brother Eric. Mm. He's coming from Galilee. Mm. They couldn't wrap their mind around the fact All right. All right. that he wasn't coming out of a palace, right. mm -hmm. but he came from a stable. Right. Yeah. And so when he came to his own, his own received him not. But I'm glad it didn't stop there because John told us, but to those who would receive yes. him. Since you 
would not accept the one of whom Isaiah the prophet would write in 53 and 3 that he is despised and rejected of men. Uh, Jerusalem, because he would not accept the one who was a man of sorrows uh, and who was acquainted of his grief. Uh, because Jerusalem, you hid as it were your faces from him. Uh, you despised him and you esteemed him not. Uh, what Jesus was saying in this text, uh, in Matthew chapter 23, uh, was therefore your house, uh, your beautiful temple is now left desolate, empty, and forsaken. Why? Because Jesus was letting them to know it. I feel the Holy Ghost in this room right now. I'd rather be born in a stable. Jesus. Where everyone from shepherds to wise men. All right. And everybody in between. You wanted me to come from the palace of Jerusalem, but I chose to come from Galilee because I'd rather be born in a stable so that everybody would be welcome from shepherds to wise men. Everybody is welcome to visit the king. Jesus. 
Church wants nothing or very little to do with it. Mm. Nobody wants to go back from the oppression from which they came. Nobody wants to identify with the rejected. Nobody wants to identify with the outcast. Nobody wants to identify with the lowly. Wow. But you've got to understand that the nature of God's kingdom is to break down all dividing walls that separate people. people. Mm. Whether they be racial, cultural walls, social, economic, political walls. Mm. The nature of God's kingdom is to abolish mm. the divisions amongst people. Mm. Jesus told Peter, upon this rock, I will build my church. We are not to be a cowering, weak church. But we are to be a force on the move. This is a recovery mission. We're looking for people of every culture, every kindred, every tongue, every nation. I know some of you probably have already gone there in your mind. John 18 and 36, Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world. And elders, I don't mean to be disrespectful for far too long. I believe we've misinterpreted this scripture and used it as a cop-out, as if somehow it implies that the church is not about to get involved with reaching the lost and being a part of our society and being a part of the cultural issues that are facing the generation in which we live today. I don't mean to be controversial, but can I tell you, amen, what Jesus was saying is that my kingdom does not proceed out of this world. The rules of my kingdom do not come from this world. They come from a heavenly world. My, my kingdom, the rules of my kingdom are based on and proceed. They originate out from another world. That's what he was saying. Yes. He wasn't telling us not to be involved with the societal issues of our day. But what he was saying is because my rules originate from another world, my servants behave differently. Mm. Because they're guided by principles of actions from another world. I believe today that the church has got to lose this air of exclusivity. All right. All right. God wants to convert our palaces of exclusivity where there is no room for people who might be different from us into stables. Where that all of humanity can come and worship Him freely. Yeah. Loving oneness. Loving holiness. Yeah. Loving the Word of God. Yeah. He told, go to Galilee. That's where you're going to see me. If you'll go to Galilee, if you're willing to identify with the lowly, if you're willing to identify with the rejected, come on, living hope. I've come to preach to you today. He's still Jesus.
good 